This is Channel 4 opening a season of programs to mark Black History Month with the first of a four-part series, Untold, Britain's Slave Trade. Five hundred years ago, Europeans and Africans met for the first time on these shores. The encounter created the slave trade and changed the world. The slave trade remains a missing chapter in our history. Yet Britain led the world in the exploitation of human cargo. This story is not just one of slave raiding by Europeans, but slave trading by Africans. Greed led African kings to sell 12 million people across the ocean. This is not a tale of a trade which grew by accident, but one of a global business created by royal appointment. The Royal African Company is to be incorporated to set to sea as many ships as shall be thought fitting for the buying, selling and bartering of gold, silver, negroes, slaves. Nor is it simply the story of passive, suffering negroes freed by heroic white crusaders, but one of black uprising. And above all, this is not a tale of a dead past it still shapes the way Britons live today. William Beckford and his father, Alderman Beckford, to put it bluntly, owned my ancestors. It brings some Britons face to face with a heritage they've never before confronted. My grandfather was what I'd consider probably a very charming man. And in his young days, he was quite a dish. <laughs> Actually, he really was. And for the first time, Britons, black and white, discover a common ancestry. It's an ancestry rooted in a past when British ships carried African slaves. Bristol. This sleepy port was once a mercantile powerhouse which dominated the transatlantic slave trade. Ships that wrenched millions of Africans from their homes crowded the Avon for a century. Yet a visitor today sees a city stripped of any reminder of that cargo. Bristol has turned its back on the trade that made it rich. I was simply amazed by the fact that there was no recognition that Bristol's wealth lay in the Atlantic trade. In vain, I went to the museum, for example, to see whether there was a display there. Not a word of it. I looked at my university and saw whether anyone was teaching it. Not a bit of it. Um, I talked to people in the street, and they were completely ignorant of it. And I think that, really, in the 20th century, Bristol went to a long period of denial. That there really was, as it were, a participation in this wider world. The city's authorities have long resisted efforts, especially by the black communities, to mark its slave trading past. There has been a genuine fear in Bristol of what the consequences would be if the truth were known. And part of the fear was generated, I think, was because the people who had the control over whether that history came out or not actually didn't know themselves what the extent and the nature of Bristol's involvement was. And I think it's more fear than denial. 
But in early March this year, the first sign of change appeared. Bristol's dignitaries gathered for the opening of a new footbridge. It was a small step, but a victory for the campaign to commemorate one of the slaves who lived in Bristol, a man called Perro Jones. We are here with our friends to show our respect to our ancestors who lived and died in the city as enslaved Africans. It's often not known that in 1725, Bristol alone enslaved 16,550 Africans in that one year. It's a bridge that helps us come to terms with, to understand and sometimes to confront a shared past. A past that contains for many of us great sadness. This moment is a sign that Britain is waking up to its slave trading history. Perro Jones belonged to a Bristol family, the Pinnies. Britain's slave past does not start with Africa. It begins in 17th century England with the British Empire's first slaves, white men. The founder of the Pinney dynasty, Azariah, was farming in Dorset when he was swept up in a rebellion against the king. The Duke of Monmouth landed in Lyme Regis in June 1685. And Azariah, probably tired of haymaking, saw these red coats crossing the end of the field and thought that looked rather more fun than haymaking. And why don't I go and join them? And off he went. And in July of 1685, he fought the disastrous battle of Sedgemoor. The Duke of Monmouth was executed, and a very large number of others were executed too. Some were transported, and Azariah, my ancestor, was one of those lucky ones. Being sent to the island of Nevis as an indented servant, which meant he was more or less a slave himself. When Azariah Pinney landed, the island of Nevis was little more than untamed bush. The English convicts were put to work alongside native Indians and a few imported Africans. They cleared the island, first for tobacco, then for a new luxury crop, sugar. At that time, the West Indies was something like a gold rush. There was this new chance to make quite a lot of money quite quickly and a lot of people came out from this country to do it. And in fact, they employed uh, Negroes imported from Africa as slaves, and they employed after uh, the uh, Battle of Sedgemoor quite a large number of white people who were indented servants like, like Azza. Azariah persuaded his sister to buy him out of servitude. Within a year, she had set him up in the sugar business. He quickly saw that convicts and Indians could not survive the harsh conditions, but his own time in the fields had shown him where the answer lay, Africa. Large numbers of Negroes were shipped from Africa uh, to the West Indies, and the, the African or the, the Negro population increased, and the white population decreased. Within two generations, his heir, John Pinney, was meticulously recording the purchase of African slaves for his booming plantations, including one he named Perro Jones. I desire you to take the earliest opportunity of buying me 10 new Negroes. Never let them be younger than 10 years, and never let them be as old as 30 if you can help it. Get them at St. Kitts or any other islands where they may be had best and cheapest. His grandfather's enslavement probably made John Pinney uneasy about owning slaves, but the scriptures stilled his conscience. I can assure you I was shocked at the first appearance of human flesh, flesh exposed, exposed to sale. But surely God ordained them for the use and benefit of us. Otherwise his divine will would have been made manifest by some particular sign or token. He was motivated by commerce. But in doing so, it seems that he regarded his slaves as his principal asset, and he looked after his asset. 
I flatter myself to say a word respecting the care of my slaves and stock. Your own good sense must tell you they are the sinews of a plantation and must claim your, your particular, particular care, care and, and attention. attention. Humanity tempered with justice towards the former must ever be exercised. They surely deserve it, being the very means of our support. They should be kept clean of ticks. The demand for the Pinnish sugar was huge. To meet the demand, they needed more slaves, but they had to raise cash to buy those slaves. They turned to the merchants in the city of London for help. The money men were prepared to give loans to planters, but it was the higher profits from the slave ships that offered the best returns. The city wanted that business all to itself. The king was always ready to trade favours for cash. He granted a royal charter which gave a single London company, the Royal African Company, exclusive rights over the slave trade. In return, the royal family became its biggest shareholders. Charles II, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, France and Ireland. To all to whom these presents shall come, greeting. Whereas Guinea, Benin, Angola and South Barbary and the sole and only trade and traffic thereof are the undoubted right of our heirs and successors, and whereas the trade of said regions is of great advantage to subjects of this kingdom. The Royal African Company is to be incorporated in the name of our dearest brother, James Duke of York, His Highness Prince Rupert, Anthony Earl of Shaftesbury, Henry Earl of Arlington, His Grace the Duke of Buckingham, John Earl of Bath. We hereby grant unto the same Royal African Company of England to set to sea as many ships as shall be thought fitting for the buying, selling and bartering of gold, silver, negroes, slaves, goods, ware and manufactures. The company's men would let nothing stand in the way of their drive for profits. They already knew that slavery was widely practiced in West Africa. In most African nations, it was an alternative to a prison system. Those who committed crimes, convicts, could be sold into slavery. If you owed a debt, you could be sold into slavery. Sometimes through deceit, or you could be tricked into slavery. Slaves were also acquired as captives of Africa's wars. Europeans had long been part of an established system for bartering them. The first Europeans who came to Ghana were the Portuguese, and they arrived in 1471. And when they got here, they found that there was a brisk trade in slaves between Ghana and its West African neighbors. And for 100 years, Portugal remained on the coast of Ghana and took part in this coastal trade. Uh, going to Senegal, bringing goods from Senegal, from Nigeria to Ghana, and bringing slaves in exchange for gold. And this was a situation before the transatlantic slave trade was introduced. The Royal African Company had no interest in the coastal trade. They wanted slaves to ship across the Atlantic. They found a ready supply in local prisoners of war. When you went to war and you defeated the people, you took captives home. So you decided what to do with the captives. How many slaves do we need for farming? How many do we need for the army? How many do we need for domestic work, etc., etc.? After they've gone through all those logistics, the excess goes through the Atlantic slave trade. The image we have today of the slave trade as mass kidnapped by Europeans couldn't be further from the truth. For both sides, this was just business. The African role in the transatlantic slave trade must not be swept under the carpet. The greed factor was there. Kingdoms made money. They rose as a result of the trade. Uh, big, powerful people, uh, rich families were created as a result of the Africans who were active collaborators in the trade. The company found that African kings were just as greedy as England's own royal family. They were willing to supply exactly what the plantations needed. The slave owners in the West Indies 
they preferred slaves from the Gold Coast. Because they said these were very hard-working, hardy slaves. Local businesses sprang up to supply the transatlantic market. The European traders had no need to round up the slaves. The Europeans themselves did not go inland to the villages or to the town to capture uh, slaves. They remained at the forts and the castles. And it was the Africans, traders, African traders, who sold the slaves to the Europeans. Now, what happened was that there were middlemen who would meet the inland traders bringing the slaves. They would buy these slaves and then in turn resold them to the uh, European merchants in the castles. Rival European powers were building castles to protect their cargoes. Within a century, there would be a fort every three miles on what used to be called the Gold Coast. It came to be known as the Slave Coast. The Royal African Company appealed to its major shareholder, James II. He began a string of garrisons, motivated possibly by the national interest, but more likely by his own profits. Every time a British ship was sighted, its sailors could rely on a welcome from the fort and from the African settlement next to it. We took up our old anchorage opposite Cape Coast Castle and made arrangements for commencing our old business of gathering a cargo. Our first object is to lay in stocks of rice for the slaves on the passage to the West Indies. You will naturally think it must be difficult to transact business with these people from ignorance of their language. But they have been for so many years trading with the English that all the traders have broken English enough for the purpose. The transatlantic slave trade dominated West Africa. For some kingdoms, selling slaves became an economic necessity. And all along the coast, new trading settlements were springing up. In the 17th century, the Atlantic slavery became the most important activity on the coast. We find that almost every town, coastal town, and almost every European fort and castle was involved in slave trading. So we have about 65 slave markets in Ghana alone. The Africans could hardly have anticipated the consequences of all this. But the bargain they struck with the European slave traders transformed the continent. What started as a local tradition turned into a monster that eventually swallowed 12 million people. Slavery existed in societies that had no prison systems. It was part of the punitive measures against criminal conduct, criminal behavior. The slaves lost their liberty. They went away, maybe into the neighboring state or the neighboring nation, but only for a season. It was not a long-term loss of liberty. And the children of the slaves, of course, were never slaves in that context. But here, of course, when, with the transatlantic slave trade, you have a, a final separation. People went away and they never came back. Slavery would spirit millions away from the continent. It would be the cause of war and torment. And it would drag both Africa and Europe into a harsh new era.
now re-engineered for maximum comfort and effortless driving. It makes every journey feel shorter. The new Vauxhall Vectra, the end of long journeys. Vauxhall, raising the standard. Tea? Not the way you make it. What's wrong with my tea? It's the same blend you do. Right. Same number of tea bags. I know. So what's the difference? This. If you live in a hard water area, you'll be amazed at the difference a Brita water filter can make because the Brita filter cartridge reduces the hardness that can leave fur in your kettle and a film on your tea. That's a lovely cup of tea. Wrong again. It's my lovely cup of tea. Brita does wonders for water. With the Woolwich, you can enjoy high interest on a savings account and instant access at cash machines with the convenience of a debit card that's accepted around the world. Card saver with the Woolwich. If you're without, ring 0845 607 1111. This is the stylish new Hotpoint Altima. And this is Purcell Performance, formulated to work with Hotpoint's new A-Class wash for brilliant cleaning. And with its outdoor fragrance, you won't be the only one to notice a difference. Purcell Performance and Hotpoint, altogether brilliant. By the 18th century, the coastal towns of West Africa were making vast profits. But the price paid by Africans was enormous. The slaves were suffering treatment they had never endured before. In the indigenous system, especially in Ghana, no slave owner had the power of life and death over the slave. But in the castle, you could do anything to the slave. You could kill the slave, you could maim the slave, you could mutilate the slave, you could punish the slave as you liked. Cape Coast Castle in modern Ghana. The headquarters of the Royal African Company. A place of misery and terror. They lived in the dungeons as though they were animals, you know, so they weren't given enough food to eat. They were prisoners. We have the condemned cell where turbulent slaves were kept. And a lot of them were turbulent because, I mean, if you live in your country and somebody comes out here and takes you into captivity, you wouldn't take kindly to that. Slaves were packed into every space. They could be trapped here for months. There were only two ways out, to the sea and the slave ships or to the graveyard. They had to go to the bathroom in the dungeons, they were fed in the dungeons. Their whole life was in the dungeons and that was very uncomfortable, very unhealthy. There could be some epidemics, no windows. They really were confined to those little rooms. The forts became a byword for cruelty and rape. The Europeans' moral restraint evaporated under the African sun. Most of the colonial um, officials who came onto the coast came without their wives. So um, most of them became mistresses. They doubled up as domestic servants, as mistresses, concubines for these officials. For some of the female slaves who lived in the dungeons, the governor saw, in inverted commas, some of the female slaves. And when they were found pregnant, if they were lucky, they were set free. The Europeans had no shame about declaring their conquests. In Cape Coast, families still carry names like Gonzalez, Coleman, Frith, and De Silva. You had the European merchants intermarrying or having African, local African women, 
and their offspring, called the mulattoes, also growing in number. As the slaves were brought in, not everybody was sold and shipped off. Some remained. And so one would see a kind of a cosmopolitan life growing along the coast. The West Africans tolerated the traders' brutality because European military backing gave them power and they needed to import cheap brass and iron tools for farming and cooking. The Africans were always hunting for a better deal. It was the small English town of Bristol which offered that deal. Local mineral deposits gave the city a unique advantage. Bristol could make high-grade metal goods cheaply. Factories spread across the Avon Valley to meet the new African demand. This is what's known as a guinea pan that was used as one of the trade items that filled the Bristol merchant ships that sailed to West Africa. And for several of these, one could exchange a slave in the early part of the 18th century. And it was because these small factories on the Avon Valley were able to develop an industrial structure to manufacture these large quantities cheaply that basically Bristol was able to develop a slave trade in the early 18th century. Bristol's golden age was dawning. The families who transformed the city used their wealth to buy huge estates. Abraham Elton's descendants still live in his stately home, Clevedon Court. Well, he was very much a self-made man. He came from a rather humble background. He was apprenticed to a mariner and became a master mariner, but clearly had a strong entrepreneurial flair and finally became a merchant. Abraham spotted the opportunities in metals. He bought land bearing extensive deposits of copper and began to search for new markets. He was looking for an outlet for his copper products. He had the raw materials for the business, he had the copper works, he had an outlet with the Bristol brass industry for the copper, but naturally he was looking for wider markets. Abraham's seafaring connections told him that Africans would pay good money for high-grade brass. He seized the opportunity. A wide number of people were involved in stocking the slave ships. So something that seems completely unconnected to the slave trade, such as the brass industry, uh, was actually very much geared to an export market to uh, the West African coast because West African warlords wanted brass pots. And so most of the brass pots were directed for what they called the Guinea trade. Abraham was an aggressive cost cutter. He and others spotted that with a simple redesign, the ships that took their metal goods to Africa could also carry slaves to the Caribbean. They could then bring back sugar to England. At a stroke, their costs were slashed and their profits doubled. Their insight gave birth to the triangular trade. What you tried to do was to fill your ships on the outward journey to Africa. You would then be paid for the slaves you took on the next leg of the journey, and then the third leg bringing the sugar and the, and the, and the tobacco back and the rum back to Bristol, which you then sold on so that you minimized, as far as you could, your financial risks. The Bristol merchants had succeeded in surpassing the Royal African Company. They gave the African customers what they wanted at half the price. It was not a, an exchange of unequals. It was an exchange of equals. One must remember that many of these African societies were very complex, and they're very urban in places. Some of the cities were very large, and Therefore, they were not going to have shoddy European goods. So it required great skill in getting the right sorts of commodities. And the Bristol merchants in particular were very skilled at, at getting, bringing together these different items which were acceptable for trade. The breakthrough in Bristol sent slave trade profits soaring. The city's restless merchants would use those profits to begin an historic shift in British life, the Industrial Revolution.
Among Abraham Elton's circle of friends was Thomas Goldney, who had made a fortune from a single successful voyage. He ploughed some of the money into the work of an old family friend, Abraham Darby. Darby was experimenting with new ways of making high-grade iron goods. He moved his works to Shropshire, where he started to smelt iron with coke, a revolutionary process. The iron produced in Colebrookdale was tough enough to make tools that would not bend or break. It opened the way to the modern age. These experiments took place in 1709, and they're generally considered to be the point, the, the, the defining moment at which the Industrial Revolution begins. What developed was a remarkable partnership between the people who had the know-how on the one hand and the people who had the money on the other. What the Shropshire ironmasters were trying to do was to find a source of coke-fired bar iron that was acceptable to the African market. And it was this, to some extent, that inspired the industrial developments that took place. The Goldney Derby partnership also inspired Ironbridge, the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. This great leap forward is usually attributed to the native genius of British engineers, but it owed much to the demands of the African trade. By 1700, ships were pouring down the Severn Valley to Bristol, carrying goods destined for buyers on the West African coast. To get a voyage to work, the merchants had to gather in commodities from the Bristol region. Many of these came from the Seven Valley, and it was the ability to get those commodities together that actually allowed the ships um, to trade with Africa and for the whole economies to work. So, in some ways, the Industrial Revolution allowed the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade, to be economically viable, to actually happen. Because without the Industrial Revolution, the commodities would have been too expensive and the African communities would not have been willing to trade. In Africa, Bristol's iron was so valuable, it became a kind of currency. Trade is all done on the principle of exchanging one piece of goods for another. All kinds of goods are priced by the number of bars of iron they're worth. Say, four muskets equal to 40 bars. Tobacco, beads and cloth, 20 bars. The total is more or less according to the value of the slave, so that supposing the bar is worth one shilling and sixpence, these goods would purchase a slave worth about nine pounds sterling, which at present is about the price of a prime slave. The sugar trade with Bristol had made Nevis rich, but it was a tedious backwater. John Pinney, now a successful sugar planter, longed to come home to Bristol. The magic of the gold rush was over. A lot of people were coming back to this country and trying to bring money they'd made in Nevis or in other West Indies back to this country. And he was one of those too. Pinney had built a great house, Mount Travis, on the island of Nevis and acquired 13 sugar estates. His grandfather had been a convict. He was returning to Bristol the equivalent of a millionaire. But he didn't leave it all behind. As he sailed away from Nevis, he brought with him the ultimate status symbol of the prosperous West Indian planter, a slave he had named Perro Jones. Perro was separated from the last of his African family, his sisters Nancy and Sharba, when he set off for England, never to return. Pinney and Perro moved into a brand new house in Bristol. He built the house that we're now sitting in. Uh, he acquired land in Somerset. He still had land and houses in Dorset. He continued in the sugar business, trading with the plantations in the West Indies at a time when sugar was becoming increasingly part of the diet. England probably seemed strange to Perro the African, but the sight of a black man was far from unusual in Bristol. Many merchants kept slaves as valets and housekeepers. 
He may have started as a slave, but he is described as a servant or valet. And he looked after John Penny personally, one imagined mixing his, bringing his shaving water, setting out his clothes and so on. He was working for John Penny for 32 years. On John Penny's return to Bristol, he found a city more interested in spending money than in making it. Complacency would cost Bristol dear. your future with the pension and investment strength of Norwich Union. With Dolphin, I just press a button and I'm through to Michelle, uh, or Tony, or Lee, <laughs> or Murray. And within your own Dolphin network, these calls are free. They call it Express Connect. I call it fantastic. Dolphin, it'll make your life a whole lot easier. I'm a, I'm a comedy snail. Watch me. Don't cross your lawn in a, in a slithery damp way. Did you know <laughs> the average customer with a complaint tells nine other people about his or her bad experience? Yeah. Why is this great news for business? Visit our website. Great. Saving energy reduces global warming. So don't waste electricity by filling your kettle to the top. Global warming. Are you doing your bit? OK, let's assume you want an individual savings account. Now, do you want to do it the hard way or the easy way? Good. Here's the number. Call 0800 626262 for the B2 tax-free savings pack. In 1794, the Bristol poet Remain Thorn wrote an epic poem in praise of the city it's somehow neglected to mention the slave trade. Majestic Bristol, to thy happy port prolific commerce makes its loved resort. Thy gallant ships with spacious sails unfurled waft to thy shore the treasures of the world. The Docklands were the heartland of Bristol and you had lovely residential houses being built just across the street from the warehouses by merchants who were all growing very grand um, by the 1720s and 30s from what was a pretty money-grubbing and uh, hands-dirtying trade. And then if you walk across to Queen Square, there were at least eight African merchants in this square that was developed in the 1720s. It was one of the first provincial examples of what people have called the urban renaissance, you know, the beautiful Georgian explosion of houses and facilities in the urban center. And it was very much financed and driven by people directly involved in the slave trade. And the whole square was really peopled by those not only in the Africa trade, but in the West India, Carolina, and Virginia trades. They were all in it. And these were the same people who while they're shipping slaves from Mangola to St. Kitts in decks no higher than four foot two inches. They're also investing in the Theater Royal. They're becoming patrons in banks. Uh, they're investing in the new private libraries. So uh, you have this strange mixture of brutality and gentility um, that is just very much part and parcel of this uh, triangular trade. In Bristol, wealth bought respectability. The men who had made their fortunes from the slave business craved social recognition. To be a trader or a merchant in the 18th century was still to have low status. You were still 
shown the back entrance, as it were. Um, so that it, when you came into vast sums of money, which is what the merch, slave merchants and the traders in slave-produced commodities acquired, you had to buy yourself into society. Now, the way to do that was simple. You had to build a, a mansion, a pile, uh, hopefully in the uh, neoclassical, neo-Palladian style, to show that you had learning or that you uh, understood the classics. And then you had to patronize art. Thomas Goldney was now one of Bristol's commercial aristocrats. He created an estate in the newly fashionable district of Clifton. The elegant veneer concealed the hard-nosed businessman. In this garden is where essentially all Goldney's interests can be linked symbolically. Out here we have the harbour, where he could see the ships coming in, the slave ships going out, his commodities, his industrial goods coming down from Shropshire. He then laid his out some wonderful gardens, including over here a tower, which is in fact an engine house, which contained a steam engine, um, the type that was used to pump mines, uh, which his investments up in Shropshire, the Coverdale Company, were producing. But he used it not to pump mines, but to pump his own water gardens, to recycle water backwards and forwards. The splendor of the Goldney estate had one main purpose, to impress Bristol's social elite. Beneath the garden, he built a grotto full of rare finds from his ventures in the South Seas and the West Indies. They thrilled his guests. Thomas Goldney, the grocer's son, was now a global player. The new rich of Bristol could leave the past behind very quickly. Goldney's friend, Abraham Elton, was now Sir Abraham. His standing in Bristol was immense. He became mayor in 1710 and had his portrait painted wearing the scarlet robes. He became MP for Bristol and he was so wealthy that he contributed 10,000 pounds to the rather depleted coffers of George I. And as is usual with these things, he was of course made a baronet. By the time he died, Sir Abraham hoped the family had buried its links to the slave business. He'd amassed a fortune by his death of £100,000 in fair money. He was somebody like Richard Branson. He made a huge amount of money through his own entrepreneurial skills. I think anybody that comes from nothing and makes that kind of a fortune on their own skill, then as now, is... Is, is, is extraordinary, is, is admirable in lots of ways. They weren't plantation owners, they weren't slavers. They were primarily concerned to export their goods to the widest possible market. And it seems to me with the Elton family, at any rate, the slaving part was just part of the cycle of trade. For the next hundred years, good works became a passion with the Eltons. The Elton that really got going with the development of Clevedon was the Reverend Sir Abraham, who was the fifth baronet. He put in the main drainage, the sewage, the gas works, he built the hospital. He was immensely concerned with the health of the town and, of course, of his estate workers. He built the churches, the schools. I'm very proud of that. The foundations of this family's wealth are now obscured by a hundred years of philanthropy and across Bristol the slave trade is virtually forgotten. In 1798, Pero, the slave John Pinney had brought from Nevis, was dying. All my family are well, except my servant, Pero, who was very ill and now at Ashton for a change of air. I much doubt his recovery. One or other of us visit him three or four times a week. He has waited upon my person upwards of 32 years. And I cannot help feeling much for him. Notwithstanding, he has not lately conducted himself as well as I could have wished. Penny sent him to Long Ashton, just outside Bristol.
where he convalesced, but then sadly died. And there is rather a charming, uh, almost an obituary, of saying uh, how much he had come to know and to like, uh, to like him. Then there's the sting in the tail, even though at the end of his days he died of drunkenness. But still, he starts off by speaking well of this servant. Perrault did not psychologically survive once removed outside of his own black community. And basically, once he came to Bristol, he drunk himself to death. Perrault, I am sorry to inform you, died a few months ago. After being almost useless, caused by drunkenness and dissipation. Almost ever since we left Nevis in 1794, his conduct has been very reprehensible, insomuch that his mistress and every branch of my family have urged me to discharge him and send him back to Nevis with an annual allowance. Perrault never made it back to his family in Nevis. The only records of his life are John Pinney's letters. But 200 years later, his name is commemorated by a bridge, a symbolic link between Bristol today and its slaving past. And we reflect on the life of Piero, the man after whom this bridge is named. Piero, a black man, brought to a strange land in circumstances of servitude. So it gives me great pleasure to name this bridge. Piero's Bridge, to honor his memory, his name, and the struggle that he represented. Thank you. By the time of Piero's death, Bristol's gentlemanly traders had been ruthlessly pushed aside. There was a new pretender to the crown of England's leading slave port. Well, Bristol's heyday in the slave trade per se was in the uh, early 18th century from 1698 till the 1740s really and then because she hadn't innovated uh, the port to accommodate the larger ships because there was a traditionalism about Bristol society mercantile society that was not as entrepreneurial didn't seize the opportunities uh, as well as newer ports like Liverpool. We find that Liverpool eclipsed her by the mid uh, 18th century and became much more important. Location had made Bristol the master of the African trade. Location also proved the reason for its downfall. The Avon's retreating tide would regularly leave ships grounded on the mud. But the slave trade was expanding and needed bigger ships. Ambitious captains started to look for ports less awkward than Bristol. It was a very difficult harbour to develop and so really uh, effectively Bristol was squeezed out of the trade by the bigger more profitable ships from Liverpool um, rather than the rather smaller scale activity that Bristol merchants developed in the 18th century. Bristol's dominance of the trade with Africa had come to an end. Its merchants had made fortunes and now moved on to other ventures but their partners in West Africa had no such alternatives. The Africans were trapped in the business of selling people. A ship's captain could buy a hundred slaves at a time in the Salaga market, and the demand from the plantations would not let up. African suppliers reached further inland. Raiding parties were now spiriting away thousands of slaves. People intentionally raided and kidnapped people into slavery. It was not like that before the Atlantic slave trade was introduced because you had enough for the indigenous system, you know, so why should I kidnap? The traders hit upon a new strategy. Wars between African nations always meant captives for sale. So the slavers supplied arms to some nations and encouraged their kings to wage war on vulnerable neighbors. When there was peace, it means there were no captives to be sold as slaves and therefore the slave trade would uh, tend to decline at that particular moment. And then when there were wars, then of course the captives would be brought and then the slave, the slave trade would be flourishing. So in a way, or to a large extent, 
the slave trade depended, I think, heavily on the conflicts between the local African people. The slave traders had started an arms race in Africa. They never gave any African nation enough weaponry to challenge European power, but the gun served to keep Africans fighting each other for a century. The years of conflict and depopulation left a legacy from which Africa has still not recovered. Many people are saying, why talk about the slave trade? We want to forget about it. It was such a terrible um, crime against humanity. Um, millions of people were sent. Again, we can't tell the number. We could talk about the number game in history. Some say 10 million, some say 12, some say 20 million. Some even say 300 million Africans were sent away. And Africa was depopulated. And all these things happened. We are putting up with it right now. The slave trade left an indelible mark on this part of Africa. When I compare it with the Nazis, uh, I think the world perhaps has not given sufficient attention to the fact that Africans had suffered a Holocaust before the Jews did. What it does to me is, is, is just a sense of outrage, of, of just limitless anger. I think that our underdevelopment can be traced to this period because by 1400, uh, people who have also used iron and uh, domesticated animals and started cereal development, uh, rice and, and corn and such things, we had no time to advance upon these. If you use the words of your most revered explorer, David Livingston, commerce, civilization, and Christianity, the three C's. Uh, the first one we understand, trade. Uh, the, the slave trade itself was a commercial enterprise. I mean, the very forts that you will see on our coastline were not uh, holiday resorts. They were, they were holding pens for, for human beings. Um, then you talk of civilization. What kind of civilization were you talking about? Africa had had civilizations. But because of the transatlantic slave trade, that civilization almost came to an abrupt end. Africa was destined for a future of poverty and conflict. England's royal venture had reinvented the trade in human beings. And Caribbean planters were refining a brutal new system, plantation slavery. program in the untold season is Tuesday at 10 and next Sunday at 8 Britain's slave trade continues by exposing Liverpool's murky past. Channel 4 book, Britain's Slave Trade by S.I. Martin, price $14.99, is available now from most bookshops.